3D printers are wonderful machines that allow us to produce physical objects quickly and in almost any shape or configuration. While early models were tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, desktop models can now be bought for a few hundred dollars. They are enjoyable to use and allow you to make a variety of household objects. Everything from toys and trinkets, to useful organizers and enclosures for your electronics projects. While there have been incredible strides in 3D printing technology to make them easier to use and more reliable, I will say that just about every printer still requires some setup, maintenance, and tweaking to get great prints. As a result, you should still view 3D printing as something closer to a hobby or project rather than a low-maintenance tool like, say, your inkjet printer. That being said, once you get the hang of it, it becomes an indispensable tool for making and prototyping physical parts. If you're thinking about getting into 3D printing or just want to refresh your knowledge, then this two-part series is for you. In this episode, I'll talk about the different kinds of printers you can buy and some accessories I recommend picking up to keep your filament dry and printer running. In the next episode, I'll go over the basics of using your printer, setting up the slicer, and printing your first part. Let's get started. The earliest known concept of a 3D printer actually comes from the science fiction short story, Things Pass By, written in 1945 by Murray Leinster. In it, he describes this strange mechanical contraption. But this constructor is both efficient and flexible. I feed magnetronic plastics, the stuff they make houses and ships of nowadays, into this moving arm. It makes drawings in the air following drawings it scans with photocells. It wasn't until the 70s and 80s that we finally got early prototypes of 3D printers. In the 90s and early 2000s, 3D printers were bulky machines that cost tens of thousands of dollars. Adrian Boyer created the first open source 3D printer in 2004, which he called the Replicating Rapid Prototyper, or RepRap. A few years later, students at Cornell released open source plans for the Fab at Home Model 1 printer in 2006. These designs helped drive a booming consumer 3D printer market and fed the early days of the maker movement. But enough with history. Let's look at the different popular printer types. The first type of printer is the one you're probably most familiar with. This process of melting plastic filament and then using X, Y, and Z controls to move the head or bed around is known as Fuse Deposition Modeling, or FDM. They can work with a variety of materials like PLA and ABS, and it is by far the most popular type of 3D printer among consumers and hobbyists. Like FDM, stereolithography, or SLA, has been around since the 1980s. It uses a UV laser to cure selective parts of liquid resin, one layer at a time. This technology has also evolved into using LCDs and light projectors to selectively cure resin layers. For example, this Creality Hallett Mage Pro uses an 8K LCD screen to achieve an impressive resolution on the prints. FDM printed objects can be made functionally fairly strong if you use materials like PETG or nylon. However, you will almost always see layer lines due to how the printing process works. There are some tricks you can use to hide these, like gap filling, sanding, and acetone vapor baths for some materials. Resin prints, on the other hand, can achieve a much higher level of detail with nearly invisible layer lines, but resin is known to be brittle, especially when exposed to UV, like from the sun. Because of these properties and how cheap resin printers have become, new communities are popping up for making custom 3D printed figurines and miniatures for gaming. Other types of 3D printing exist, like polyjet printing, which uses an inkjet-like print head to sprinkle resin onto a build plate, and selective laser sintering, which uses lasers to bind powdered plastic particles together. Each method has its advantages and disadvantages. We'll focus on FDM, as it's the most popular method for consumers right now. Within FDM, you have a few different printing styles. Older consumer models moved the print head in the horizontal plane. In this Fab at Home Model 1, the print head moved left to right on a gantry above the bed. This made up the x-axis. The entire gantry would move in and out to constitute the y-axis. 
Note that the actual control axes for most core XY models are along the diagonals, so some math is required to convert Cartesian X and Y coordinates to the motor movements. Finally, the bed could move up and down, which is the Z axis. On some printers, the gantry moves instead of the bed. This is known as a core XY configuration. While this is an older design, you can still find Core XY printers today. The advantage is that the bed stays relatively still so your model does not move much, which allows for taller models and faster printing. You also have the bed slinger style. This is a type of Cartesian printer as the motors move the print and print head relative along the X and Y axes. Like with Core XY, the print head moves along the X axis on a gantry. However, instead of the gantry moving, the whole bed moves along the Y axis. The bed or gantry moves in the Z axis so that layers can stack on top of each other. Bed slingers are often simpler, cheaper to manufacture, and easier to maintain. However, you might see issues in the top layers of a print due to the movement of the bed. This limits the height and print speed of many bed slingers. You'll also run across delta printers. This style has a print head suspended by three arms connected to a base, usually above the bed. Like with Core XY, some math is performed to translate the motion of the three arms into X and Y coordinates in the horizontal plane. The print head or bed will also move up and down in the Z axis to create layers. While Delta printers were popular a few years ago for tall and fast prints, Core XY technology has gotten better, so you'll mostly see Core XY these days used to accomplish the same thing. FDM printers also have two main types of extruders. The first is the direct drive extruder. The drive mechanism is the motor, usually a stepper, and gearing that pulls the filament from the spool and pushes it into the hot end. The hot end consists of the parts required to heat the filament to its melting point, such as the heating block, sensor, and nozzle through which the melted plastic is pushed. In a direct drive extruder, the drive mechanism and hot end are connected, usually found as part of the print head that moves around on the gantry. On the other hand, the drive mechanism and hot end are separated in a Bowden extruder setup. The drive mechanism is often attached to the frame of the printer while the hot end moves around. A Bowden tube, often made of heat-resistant PTFE or Teflon, helps guide the filament from the drive mechanism to the hot end and protects the filament from snagging on parts of the printer. You'll often see similar guide tubes on direct drive setups, but they aren't required. Because the drive mechanism is not located on the print head in Bowden setups, the print head is lighter and can move faster. This results in faster prints and less wear on the moving parts. However, you'll often find that Bowden drives have more oozing out of the nozzle and can struggle with flexible filaments like TPU. Some 3D printers have multiple extruders or can automatically change the filament, which allows you to print with various materials and colors. There are many other printer styles and even some esoteric methods used to create molten plastic layers for 3D printing. Which printer you buy is up to you. Each has its advantages and disadvantages, so I recommend reading reviews to figure out the best printer for your needs and within your budget. I'll be using my Lulzbot Sidekick 747 for these videos. It is a bed slinger style FDM printer which is common for many consumer models. It also uses a direct drive extruder that takes a single filament at a time. I'll show you some tips and tricks that I've learned and I'll do my best to make them generic enough to apply to most FDM printing. Remember how I said that 3D printing is still something of a hobby or project? That's because you'll need to spend some time fiddling with your machine and tweaking settings to get good, consistent prints. You'll want to pick up some accessories to help you on this journey. Some printers come with a packet of accessories, but I still find that's often not enough. Let's go through some of my favorite tools. For the essentials, you'll want a metal scraper for removing prints from the bed, wire cutters for clipping filament or cleaning parts, and tweezers for removing oozing filament from the hot end. Don't try to do this with your hands, as you can very quickly burn your fingers on the nozzle. Ask me how I know. If you touch the bed, you can leave oil from your skin on the surface, which can prevent the first layer from sticking. As a result, I highly recommend using some rubbing alcohol and a task wipe to wipe down the bed in between prints. 
This goes a long way to helping with first layer adhesion. My favorite is Elmer's Purple Washable Glue Stick. You know, the kind used for arts and crafts in kindergarten. Just rub a light layer on the bed and you're good to go. You can easily wash it off parts in the bed with soap and warm water. If you find that your nozzle is collecting gunk, I recommend using a soft brass brush to lightly clean it while it's hot. Be very careful when doing this. There are often wires in the back actively carrying current to the nozzle, fan, or extruder, and you can short out something from the brass bristles. This can permanently damage the print head, so again, be careful. You'll also want some hand tools to clean up your prints. For me, this is often a deburring tool for removing sharp edges and burrs. I also recommend some hand files and sandpaper for removing burrs and helping parts fit together. Removing layer lines is very difficult. If you want to do that, you'll need gap filling material or acetone vapor baths, which I won't get into in this series. A set of calipers will help make sure that parts are printed correctly and they can help you design your own parts, which I'll cover in my introduction to FreeCAD series later. I highly recommend getting a screwdriver and a hex key set if you don't already have them. You'll need to make repairs should something happen to your 3D printer. Filament has a habit of absorbing moisture from the atmosphere, which can result in printing problems like these gaps. To help slow the absorption rate, I recommend a 5-gallon bucket sealed with a screw-on lid. Spools fit perfectly in them. I also really like these rechargeable desiccant packets that slide between the spools and the bucket. They help absorb any moisture that might get into the bucket. I keep all of my filament in here when it's not in use. Some filament types, like PET-G, are particularly hygroscopic, meaning they will absorb water very quickly, say in a few hours in a human environment. While a sealed container with desiccant will slow the absorption rate, it won't actively remove water from the filament. So when your filament becomes wet, you need to bake it at a low temperature for a few hours. These dedicated filament dehydrators work very well for that task. Modified food dehydrators will also do the trick. I like running a filament tube from the dehydrator to the printer so that I can actively keep the filament dry while printing. You probably don't need a dehydrator unless you find that your filament is causing problems. Another optional accessory is an enclosure for your printer. These can help prevent breezes from nearby fans or AC from cooling your parts too fast, as well as keep the ambient temperature around the print higher. You don't need this for things like PLA or PETG, but some materials like ABS, ASA, polycarbonate, and nylon usually require an enclosure as the part needs to stay warm during printing. Finally, while all melted plastics produce fumes, some are worse than others. ABS is a particularly bad offender. So if you start working with these materials, I recommend finding ways to filter the fumes using something like activated carbon or venting the fumes outside. I do both. Fumes from 3D printers can be a health hazard depending on the material you're using, the concentrations of the chemicals in the air, and how long you're exposed to them. PLA isn't too bad, but I recommend looking into enclosures and finding ways to filter or vent them if you start working with other types of filament. Even a cheap photo booth or grow tent will work. You can find the Lulzbot printer that I'm using, a lot of different filament options, and many of the tools that I'm showing on DigiKey's website. With a well-made printer, you should not need to do much maintenance. However, I often find that I need to tighten the belts or clean the nozzle a couple of times per year. Every printer is a little different, and the manual should have the manufacturer's recommended maintenance schedule. I hope this helps give you some ideas on what to look for in a 3D printer. In the next episode, I'll walk you through the process of downloading the model, using the slicer, and printing your first part. See you then. Thank you.